Welcome to Gerard Alliance Church Online. I'm so glad that you decided to watch this video and I'm excited uh, because we're going to be looking at a new sermon series. It's called What Happened After. But before we start, would you take a moment and pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I just pray for each person that's watching this video right now. Lord, whatever they're dealing with, whatever circumstances they're facing, whatever situations uh, that seem too unbearable for them, Lord, I just pray right now that they will lay it at your feet. I pray that they will seek your face. Uh, Lord God, I, I just pray that your will will be done, uh, that you will draw all men and women unto yourself, Lord. We love you, and we thank you. Would you bless this time? May we learn your truth, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, how easy is it for you to forget a detail? It's interesting how memories work. If you ask me what I ate for lunch two weeks ago, I couldn't tell you. But I could go on and on and on about the Valentine's Day dinner that I was able to share with my wonderful wife, Anne-Marie, on Saturday, February 18th, 2023. If you asked me what the most traumatic moment in my life was, I could tell you two or three episodes of seizures that I had growing up, or uh, the time I cracked my head open while I was, a, was pole vaulting, or uh, the most awesome two moments of my life, uh, the birth of my children. There are memories that we remember like yesterday, and then there are memories that we forget the same moment that they happen. The human mind is fascinating. Why do you remember that but can't seem to remember this? Why do lyrics of a song come so easily to mind but it's hard to recall uh, or reference Bible verses? I could recite movie lines in my sleep but can't for the life of me remember how to get certain places. And I mean thank the Lord for GPS. See, it it seems that there is a repetitiveness to memory. If you do something over and over and over again, it's easy to remember. I'm sure that's why a lot of people believe that motto, practice makes perfect. But does it really? It should read, practice makes almost perfect. When we think about something being repetitive, there are two factors that are influenced by repetition. One, quantity, and two, quality. Now, of course, depending on the subject at hand, most people desire quality over quantity. But there are occasions when quantity seems to be more beneficial. But there are occasions that that happens. And in this entire thought process, got me thinking about something. We are fresh off the most important event in the history of humanity, Jesus' resurrection, and I wondered what happened after. Have you ever thought about that before? It seems that repetition can breed routine. Anything that develops into routine is in danger of becoming indifferent, dispirited, or simply unconcerned. And here's my dilemma. What do I preach after the greatest, most awesomest event? Well, for the next two weeks, I want us to look at what happened after that greatest and most awesomest event. Typically, we celebrate Easter to remember the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But then life moves on, right? But you have to realize that life didn't just move on for those who were impacted by Jesus' resurrection. It's, it's not as if they skipped a beat and had a moment of silence and then went about doing what they had done before they had met Jesus. So, with that being said, please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 24, 13 through 31. Luke 24, 13 through 31. Luke 24, 13 through 31. Now, as you're turning there, typically when I preach a sermon, I like to keep a limited amount of verses. 
It would be great to do an in-depth study into each particular verse. Uh, We do a verse-by-verse study in our evening Bible study on Sunday evenings. Uh, You're more than welcome to join us on Zoom. We are currently walking through the book of Hebrews. If you go on to our website, you can find our bulletin that we place on the website. And the Zoom uh, link is there for you. So you are more than welcome to come and join us in our verse-by-verse study. But on any given Sunday morning, I try to refrain from preaching uh, on large or long passages of Scripture. I was actually taught in college and seminary uh, that uh, less is more. Keeping it to about 13 to 15 verses is the max. So forgive me because today we'll be looking at 19 verses and next week we'll be looking at 18. But I I put a lot of thought and consideration into all this because there are exceptions to that limited verse rule, if you ask me. I, I think it's good to have enough text to establish and build the context. It's important to know where we are coming from, what has just happened, but today and next week we'll focus on what happened after. So let's look at verses 13 through 16 together. Undercover Jesus, undercover Jesus, 13 through 16. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were, walk, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. I I want us to notice something right from the get-go. Luke makes a reference in verse 13 here, now that same day. Now that phrase should trigger something. That would mean whatever has been said previously goes along with what is to come. So right before this passage, Luke writes in verses 9 through 12 this. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of Jesus, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. So, the women come back from Jesus' empty tomb to tell the eleven and all the others what had happened. And just so we're clear, Luke gives a roll call of all the women who were all present and accounted for at Jesus' tomb. And yet, he cannot help but exclaim, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Hey, listen, no way. There's no possible way that could happen. You're dreaming. Or worse off, you're insane. You're going crazy right now. But have you ever heard something that seems so unbelievable that it was believable? And you know what? It only takes one. It only takes one. One person to try and verify the women's story, and who better than Peter himself? Peter arrives at the tomb, he sees, he leaves, and he wonders to himself what had happened. Have you ever been in a situation where your mind just creates a million different scenarios, right? I cannot help but think that's what happened to Peter in this moment. So what scenario do you feed yourself? What consumes your time and attention, your heart and your mind when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? So here we are. It's on the same day the women meet the angel, the disciples, and all those who are with them that they don't believe their story, and Peter visits Jesus' tomb for himself, that this reading, what we're reading here, occurs. This is what happened after. And undoubtedly, these two people that Luke is referring to were a part of that empty tomb announcement. 
Now, there's one thing that I wish the gospel writers, especially Luke here, would have done. I wish they would have given more detail into what happened after Jesus' resurrection. It seems as if they give more of a generic sort of, of, of language, right? They all just simply say they were, were talking with each other about everything that had happened. See, they use that phrase, everything that had happened, a lot. But if you think about it, I guess if they were to record every single detail and word and every thought and emotion and expression, our Bibles would be way thicker and heavier. But for some reason or another, Luke says that they were talking about the most recent events. And he goes as far to say, as they talked and discussed these things. 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 What things? Well, the one thing my dad did his best to teach me is when you're having a discussion with someone to try to use the word thing as least as possible. Let me give you two examples. Suppose you're fixing something and you ask someone to hand you that thing over there. Well, if you're doing the job in your garage or out back, how on earth are they going to know what you mean by thing? Right? How do they know what you're talking about? I mean, it could be a tool or a bottle of water or an ice cream sandwich or a can of oil. I mean, do you see what I mean? Or when you arrive home from work and your spouse says, right when you walk in the door, hey, don't forget that we have to go to that thing tonight. Well, that could mean a lot of different events. Their boss's work party, a, a play or a recital or a, a game, uh, the appointment to get your taxes done. I mean, thing could mean a lot of things, right? When I worked in retail, they had these people known as secret shoppers. And their job was to come in and assess everything from asking for help to locating things around the store and purchasing items. They would, of course, uh, evaluate their experience after they were done. But the problem is that if we caught wind of it, that there was a secret shopper coming, then we were all on our toes, kind of like when the health inspector comes, right? 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 If, you, if you know when they're coming, you put your best foot forward and you are on your best behavior. It kind of reminds me of that show, Undercover Boss. That's such a cool show. I, I wondered, what if they made a few episodes called Undercover Pastor? right? Where the pastor dressed up as a parishioner. They just came in and they sat and they observed and they participated. I wonder how that would open the eyes of not just the congregation, but the leadership of the church. See, Luke shares with us an interesting detail. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. I mean, can you imagine this? What it would have been like? Think about this. Just last week, we talked about this just last week, the women were suddenly met by Jesus. And it brought them all to the point of worship. You know, Jesus could have done that for these two followers on the road to Emmaus. But for some reason, he doesn't. He doesn't reveal his identity to them. Luke tells us that the undercover Jesus simply came up and walked along with them. But there had to be a reason, right? There needed to be a purpose for why Jesus was kept from being recognized by them. Second, let's look at verses 17 through 24. Good grief, let's talk about it. Good grief, let's talk about it. Verses 17 through 24. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers 
handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. You know, every single person possesses their side of the story. This undoubtedly must have been the most traumatic and tragic stories to date for those who were followers of Jesus. Do you know those moments where people react by asking, ooh, too soon? Well, this may have been too soon for Cleopas and his companion that joined him on the road to Emmaus. I mean, that could simply be why they were kept from recognizing him. So here, the dialogue begins between Jesus and his two followers. The question is is pretty simple. What are you discussing? Jesus wanted to know what has kept their attention this entire time. You know, it may have seemed that they could not stop talking about it. But notice their reaction. When Jesus asks them what they are discussing, they're frozen. They stop dead in their tracks, and their faces express it all, downcast, disappointed, sad, burdened, depressed. These are all just a few descriptions of that word. The more they talk about whatever it was that they were talking about, it seems that the more and more they become depressed. Good grief. Is there such a thing as good grief? Grief is a pain that accompanies loss. And loss is not limited to the loss of people. But this kind of loss, losing someone, is the most difficult. It's the hardest to deal with. And it takes time to process grief. In fact, many psychologists and therapists would say that the best prescription to help the grieving process is to talk about it. To talk about what? Well, every, everything from how the loss happened to how it's causing the grief and even includes what happens after. You know, it's too bad that we don't know much about this follower named Cleopas. He seems to be a contender with Peter as someone who is bold and just tells it like it is. Cleopas doesn't hold anything back. I mean, at this point, he shoots straight with this man who seems to be oblivious to the most recent events. Here's the quick dialogue between the two. Cleopas asks Jesus, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these last days? He was probably thinking, everyone within a 30 mile radius knows what's been happening. News traveled fast in those days. So how on earth is this guy clueless to what has just happened? It almost, interestingly enough, it it almost seems insulting. I mean, does this guy just not care? Is he in denial and doesn't want to talk about it? Don't want to face the reality of what has just occurred? I mean, how could you not know what has been happening for the past two weeks in Jerusalem. And Jesus simply responds, what things? <laughs> what things? You know, they don't know that he knows, and he knows that they don't know he knows. And so here we are, just setting the bait a little bit. Jesus seems to be going fishing. And they reply about Jesus of Nazareth. You know, whether it's ir- they're just irritated or annoyed, they look at him and say, Jesus of Nazareth. Like, sense the tone here, buddy. The Jesus of Nazareth. But maybe this was good grief. You see, if Jesus would have let them in on his secret, even if for a moment he gave them a closed-ended answer or question, they wouldn't be able to talk it out, to talk about their grief. 
The discussion could have ended rather quickly. Who knows? They may have wanted to, to pick the pace up a little bit or, or stop somewhere and wave goodbye and say, well, we'll, we'll catch up with you later. It, it was nice meeting you. We'll be in touch, right? But for some reason or another, the silence Jesus gives between his question and the answer of Jesus of Nazareth, the flood gates open for these two followers. They can't help but bring this guy up to speed. It's not really a moment of confession. It's more of an eyewitness account. It's the my side of the story kind of thing. And the fact that I wonder is how much of what these followers tell Jesus is truly how they feel. I I just want to highlight a few phrases. First he says, he was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. This doesn't, this, this doesn't take away Jesus' power, but notice Jesus' death and supposed resurrection equates a title of prophet. Prophet. So wait a minute. Does that mean they didn't believe he was the Messiah? I, I mean, they don't even use the word Lord here. I wonder how much of Jesus' authority and power influenced them. Or would they have been more persuaded by the people? Remember in Matthew 28, at Jesus' ascension, before Jesus gives the Great Commission, it says in verse 17, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Could it be that Cleopas and this other follower may have been counted among those who would soon doubt. Then he says, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Place. Don't miss that. They say, we had hoped. They can't even say the name Messiah. It would seem too difficult for them. Maybe a knot formed in the back of their throat as they thought about all of this and said all of this. Who knows? And, and think about the timing of all of this. Jesus' death would have been the final blow to their hopes of him redeeming Israel. And to make it even worse, he's been dead two full days with no end in sight. And usually when you hope for something, you count down the days, right? But Cleopas and his friend, it seems like they're counting up the days. And they're currently at three. And the last thing is the testimony of of others. The testimony of others. They were amazed at the women's testimony, the empty tomb, the vision of the angel, and the message that Jesus is alive. I mean, wouldn't that spark hope? Wouldn't that beg a deep desire for investigation? As if, as if you may have wanted to see it for yourself. See, the testimony of others had to be pretty hard, though. Like, why them? Why did they get to encounter and experience it and not me. Why couldn't I have witnessed these things? At least it would have brought closure and peace of mind, right? To add to that, Peter could confirm the women's story, but you know what? There's still a problem. There's a negative phrase that Luke uses in both of these testimonies that they give. These two followers of Jesus tell the unrecognizable Jesus But the women didn't find his body, and they did not see Jesus. Bam! Right then and there. That would have been an awesome moment for Jesus to reveal himself to them, but he doesn't. He waits. Good grief. An opportunity to express thoughts and feelings that will definitely shape the hearts and lives of these two followers. Lastly, let's look at the final part to this. A beautiful deja vu. Verses 25 through 31. 25 through 31. 
he said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, and broke it and began to give it to them. Then, then their eyes were opened And they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Have you ever had any uh, deja vu moments? I like what one article from Cleveland Clinic said about this phenomenon. It is a transitory sensation of having already lived a totally identical situation at some point in the past. Neurologist Dr. Jean Curry writes, Deja vu is a false sense of familiarity where your brain creates a sensation as if you have lived a certain situation before, but you're unable to retrieve it from your memory and cannot identify the actual situation. You know, I never thought of it that way before. A false sense of familiarity. When deja vu happens, our minds literally literally create an illusion. What has happened seems to be happening again. I, I find this fascinating because there have been multiple moments when dreams have come into play. Certain places that we dream about and, and then somehow we have deja vu that we've been there before when we really haven't. Events are also popular for deja vu, as if we've already done something, maybe multiple times, that it's recorded a memory. Regardless, this encounter with Jesus is going to become a beautiful deja vu for these two followers. But for the time being, it's not very kosher, right? Just as bluntly as Cleopas questions Jesus, Jesus puts them in their place. Now, let's remember, these two have probably been following Jesus for a while. They probably came across or even heard that Jesus predicted his own death three times over. And what seems to trigger Jesus' blunt question is the moment Cleopas said, but we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. Boom, that right there, that little seed of doubt, fear, and disappointment. Jesus makes a statement and then asks a question. He says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. There's a statement. And here's a question. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Really? Did you not listen to anything I spoke about while I was with you for three years? It's as if it went in one ear and out the other, right? Jesus calls them foolish and slow. Hesitant, second guessing, slow to believe. The more accurate translation of this phrase is slow in heart to believe. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that they are not quick to perceive. They are dull in their learning. They had suffered from their previous opinions and biases to prevent them from seeing the evidence that Jesus must die and rise from the dead. And yet again, Luke makes it clear that Jesus educates them, right? He revisits the many teachings and prophecies that point directly to him. I mean, can you imagine what this encounter must have been like for the two followers? I mean, unreal, powerful. It's like a beautiful deja vu. I wonder if at any moment, they thought to themselves, wow, this, this guy sounds familiar. 
This, this guy seems familiar to us. This person, when they teach and speak, they speak with power and influence. Yeah, I love how this dialogue ends. One thing I want you to want to encourage you on is don't miss the moments. Say that with me. Don't miss the moments. As they arrive at their destination, I can't help but think that they have this sudden desire, this longing to spend more time with Jesus. But remember, at this point, they don't recognize it's Him. I find... I find Hebrews 13, too, a really fascinating verse. It says this, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. But still, it says that they urged him strongly. They wouldn't take no for an answer. And I wonder how much convincing they had to do for Jesus to stay. There was something about this man that the followers were fascinated by. They, they, they simply just couldn't explain it, but they just knew they needed more time with him. All right, are you ready now? Here's the setup. They do something that is so commonplace. It's routine. They've done this so many times in the past. They sit at the table. They're ready to eat. Ready to to fill not just their bellies, but ready to fill their souls as well. Something simple yet profound happens. What happened after that? Well, Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. No way! Wait a minute! Could it could it be? Could could it be him? Could this man that we've traveled with? For hours, could this truly be the Messiah? Then it happens, just as fast as it began, their eyes were open, they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. What? I mean, wow! He was here, he was gone in a flash, in an instant. Speechless, these two followers are, but they're filled with with hope. Can you imagine Cleopas and the other followers sharing this story? Of course, Luke had to have found out somehow or else he wouldn't have been able to record it in his gospel. And for some reason, this story impressed Luke that he's actually the only one who mentions it. And he must have been pretty fascinated by it. Probably fascinated to the point where he kept asking Cleopas and this other follower, what happened after? What happened after? This undoubtedly made an impression on Jesus' followers. See, what happens after the resurrection of Jesus is pretty important. For 40 days post-resurrection, Jesus visits and teaches. He blesses and breathes on them. John recalls the moment pretty vividly in John 20, 21 through 22. It says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And guess what? What happens after is incredible. But for now, Cleopas and his friend, both followers of Jesus, have just been mesmerized by their encounter at the table. Think about it. The very act of breaking bread and eating together. They've they've done it a thousand times before. And more than likely they'll have a thousand more times to do it. But this time, this one moment, they'll never forget. That moment, their eyes were opened And they recognized Jesus. What happened after? Only time will tell. Would you take a moment to pray with me? 
Father God, we thank you and praise you for today. We thank you for this message that has been spoken. God, however it resonates with each one of us, I pray, Holy Spirit, by your power and your wisdom, that you will speak life into us and use it to transform us and change us into the likeness of Jesus. We love you and we thank you. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in that grace.